Chapter Forty Two of Tell It All by Fanny Stenhouse. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Amusing Troubles of My Talkative Friend, Charlotte with the Golden Hair. Not long after our separation from the Mormon Church, I received another visit from my talkative friend as according to her custom she was making a preliminary fuss at the door before entering i heard her voice and was at a loss to conjecture whether she came for the purpose of lamenting my apostasy and entreating my immediate return to the bosom of the church or to condole with me concerning the brutal outrage to which we had been subjected in both suppositions i was however mistaken she came to talk about her own woes you'll be surprised my dear sister stenhouse she said to see me looking so utterly miserable i'm sure i must look the picture of despair and i feel it you don't know what i've been suffering and how shamefully i have been used you look very well i think but i'm sorry to hear you have met with any difficulty said i and she stopped for a moment to take a breath oh you may say so she replied but you know you don't think so in your heart why i did not even stop to put on my bonnet straight she said stealing a look at the glass and i ran all the way here for i felt as if i should die if i could not pour my sorrows into the bosom of some faithful-hearted friend oh i have been treated shamefully and i feel it the more as you know what a reserved woman i am and how seldom it is that i open my lips about family matters even to my dearest friends well but i said what really is the matter you have not yet told me what your trouble is sister stenhouse she said you have had a few little vexations in the course of your life i know but they are nothing to compare to the frightful indignities that i have suffered in the course of the last few days i never thought i should come to this i hate every man in the place and i detest my husband most of all and i loathe his wives and i execrate brother brick why sister anne what can have happened i exclaimed interrupting her happened she cried starting from her chair in indignation i tell you sister stenhouse nothing has happened nothing was done by chance he did it all with his eyes open against my advice i tell you he did it on purpose did what i asked and who was it that did it but by this time i had begun to form a shrewd guess as to who the culprit was why he married that wretched little shrimp of a girl with blue eyes and red hair and a die-away lackadaisical manner it was he my husband henry he married her this very day and i tell you he did it on purpose i'm sorry that it annoys you i said but really i am surprised after all you have said to me that you should care if he had taken a half dozen wives to say nothing of the one he married this morning and who you say is only a very little one it doesn't matter the size sister stenhouse she said but the color of the eyes and the shade of the hair matters a great deal if that miserable little minx had had black hair or green eyes i dare say henry would not have cared two straws about her unless he had done it out of sheer perversity for all men are made of the same contrary stuff but he dotes on blue eyes i heard him myself tell her so one day when i was listening to them through the crack of the door and they didn't know i was so near but my wounded feelings would not suffer me to remain silent and i bounced in and said i henry how dare you talk such outrageous nonsense to that child in my presence but i didn't know you were present he said i tell you said i i am quite disgusted with you a man with three wives and me one of them to go talking twaddle to a little chattering hussy like that with her cat's eyes and her red hair golden hair my dear he said charlotte's hair is golden i say red it's straight staring red as red as red can be i told him and then we had a regular fight over it 
i don't mean that we came to blows but we had some hot words and he went out and left us two alone then that young hussy was impudent and i don't know how it was but somehow when we left off our conversation i found some of charlotte's red hair between my fingers and there she said innocently holding out quite a respectable sized tuft of auburn hair there i put it to you sister stenhouse is that red or is it not i was about to reply but without waiting an instant she dashed the stolen locks to the ground and said i dare say sister stenhouse you think me quite a little hasty and yet among my friends i've always been quite proverbial for the calmness and evenness of my temper but i've been tried very much lately and if only you would not keep interrupting me dear if you'd just allow me to say a word or two in my turn i'd tell you something that would open your eyes to the ingratitude and wickedness of men i don't wonder that you have left the church i am thinking of doing so myself and you won't wonder at it when you hear what i've got to say what do you say to my leaving the church won't people be astonished but i declare sister stenhouse i do seriously mean to leave the church as soon as i get my new bonnet why your new bonnet i asked in surprise because dear i shall become an object of interest all the sisters will have their eyes upon me and even gentiles will say there's a lady who had the courage to leave the mormon church and quit an ungrateful husband who was not worthy of her and you know sister stenhouse it would not do to have people looking at me and talking about me before i got my new bonnet oh yes she said i ought to have told you that before but i was so angry at what had just happened that i forgot everything else the fact is that my husband is a man and there's no calculating what a man will do women you know are proverbial for the constancy of their affections and their slowness in changing their minds you know when you're talking to a woman that she is a woman and you know exactly what to do with her but with a man it's quite different you can't calculate a man you can't fathom him when you've been thinking one way and another and at last begin to fancy you know what to do why then a man if it's him you've got to do with will turn just round and while you've been making everything smooth for him to do one thing he'll go and do exactly the opposite i know what men are by this time and i speak from experience it was just so with henry and this girl he has gone quite against the grain with me and i feel it all the more because he used to be so quiet and anxious to do exactly what i wanted but he doesn't care a fig now whether i'm pleased or not he only thinks about this red-headed girl in fact he's quite crazy about her and if there's any sin in apostasy you may remember that it was he who drove me into it that seems hardly fair i said for you knew all along that it was his privilege to take more wives that's very true she exclaimed it is his privilege to take wives but it's my privilege to choose them for him i'm a good mormon and i don't mind how many wives my husband takes if he'll only act reasonably about getting them but sister stenhouse i do not want a parcel of girls about the house i'm so far from wishing to usurp authority that as i told henry i would not mind if his wives were even a little older than me but i won't have them younger it makes henry look so silly why to see him with that girl charlotte now who isn't more than half my own age no i don't mean that i mean she's slightly younger than i am you might really almost imagine that he thought more of her than he does of me i know he doesn't for he has told me so but any one to see them together would quite get a wrong impression when did he marry charlotte i asked you spoke so hastily sister anne that i did not quite understand you when why he married her this morning as i thought i told you he has only just done it he said he was anxious to be in a quiet state of mind today 
so i gave him a piece of my mind and he was so astonished at the pointed way in which i explained to him what a fool he'd been making of himself that he quite showed it in his face the fact is sister stenhouse he has lately become rather more than i could manage about six months ago he seemed i thought to be getting a little inattentive to his last wife so i thought it was quite time for me to see about finding him another so i looked round but didn't for some time meet with a suitable person at last i found a very nice young woman thirty-five or forty years of age who i thought would do she was nice and tall a little taller than henry himself but that didn't matter for she was stout in proportion henry would have it that she didn't look straight with her two eyes but that was all nonsense she was a nice motherly woman with a deep bass voice which sounds so well in large fat women but though she wasn't what you would call handsome she certainly wasn't plain my reason in choosing her was that i thought she would do nicely for the housework and could look after the children for i was forced to stay at home so much that it was quite injuring my health a very good reason i said so i thought dear she replied but i could not bring henry to see it in that light whenever i spoke to him about her he said that she was old enough to be his grandmother and squinted at last i got quite tired out for i could never get him to call upon her and when she came to the house he hardly said a word to her so i got her to come and stay with us for then i thought henry would become accustomed to her presence but he took to holding his tongue at meal times the only times when we all met together and it was as much as i could do to keep up the conversation for you know i am naturally very taciturn then he suddenly took to attending all the church meetings and it was astonishing how many he discovered it was his duty to attend he seemed to be absent almost every evening the mystery to me was what could have made him so pious all of a sudden he seemed altogether too good you can understand sister stenhouse that had there been any young girl at the meetings to whom he had taken a fancy it would have been useless for them to try to throw dust in my eyes you know that i'm not likely to be deceived i said that i did know it and she continued there was one of the brethren a near neighbor of ours who between ourselves i think rather admires me for he said once quite publicly that i beat every one he knew in conversation and if that's not a compliment i don't know what is well this brother i got to watch my husband i told him that i did not want him to act as a spy upon his movements as that would have been very mean i only wanted him to watch carefully all that he said and did at the meetings and to notice who he spoke to and if it was a meeting where women were admitted to be doubly watchful and especially to notice how he looked when he talked with anyone you see sister i agree with you that it is quite right for us to look closely after our husbands although of course i would be the last one to encourage a system of espionage i ventured to suggest that i had not expressed any opinion at all about watching our husbands and said i believed there were not half a dozen women in salt lake city who would dare to think of such a thing well never mind all that sister stenhouse she said if you did not have that opinion you might have had it and it comes to much the same thing i used to see the good brother i spoke of very frequently in fact almost every day and the first question i always asked was did my husband come to meeting last night and often as not he said he didn't know for he hadn't been himself and after a month or more i had learned nothing except that my husband was never seen with a lady at any of the meetings this was all very well but so certain was i that all his dressing and titivation was not done for nothing and that he wouldn't be so pious without expecting to get something in return 
for he is a very good and sensible man in all religious affairs, that I resolved to take the whole affair in hand myself, and ferret out the mystery, if there really was one. The very next night he went out as usual, and I, having dressed myself in readiness, followed him. But we hadn't gone two minutes' walk before I met the brother I just mentioned, and of course I was compelled to stop and tell him all about it, and by the time we left off my husband was out of sight, and it was no good looking after him. Some people, when they begin to talk, you never know when they'll end, and this good brother is one of them. You can't edge in a word. Well, you see, now I was out, it seemed a pity to go home without calling upon someone, so I went round to Sister Ellis. They told me she was out, and I was just going away, when, lo and behold, who should I see but my dear Henry marching down the street, in the direction of the theatre, with a red-headed girl hanging on his arm. Oh, I said to myself, that's the kind of church meeting you go to, my dear, is it? They were so busy with one another I never saw Henry look worse or more stupid in my life that they didn't see me at all. I did not cross over to them, for I felt too much compassion for their folly to wish to interrupt them then. Go on, my dears, I thought, make the most of your opportunity, for I'll answer that one of you won't go to the theatre again for some time. I wasn't the least bit jealous. Jealousy is a sentiment that could never dwell in my bosom, but I did hate the sight of that odious girl, and I resolved to take my husband in hand immediately. Well, sister, I said, I should have thought that his finding a wife for himself would have saved you a world of trouble. Oh, dear, no, sister Stenhouse, she replied. It was trouble I did not want to be saved. Men have no business, in my opinion, to choose their own wives after the first. I know the men do do it, one and all, but it's a shameful stretch of authority. I should like to know whether it is not of much more consequence to me what wife my husband has than it is to him. However, I resolved that my husband should never marry the red-headed girl, and the very next morning I told him so, and what do you think the inhuman creature said? You've been persuading me all these years, he said, to take another wife, although I've already got three, and now I've begun to do so, you blame me. I think I've as good a right as anyone to say who I'll marry and who I won't. Did you ever hear such ingratitude? Would you hear of such a thing from your husband, Sister Stenhouse? I told her that with Mormonism my husband had given up polygamy, and she continued, Well, I tried to bring him to reason, but it was of no use, and then I told him that the girl should never set foot inside the house while I was in it. This was a very unfortunate speech, for I do believe that up to that time he wanted as much as possible to keep the girl out of my way, but the moment I said that, to show his dignity, I suppose, he declared that she should come to tea with us that very afternoon, and he would go and fetch her. And he did so. I wouldn't go down to tea at first, though both the other wives were there, and he set up for me, but my pride would not allow me to stoop. At last I got tired of being all alone, and as it occurred to me that perhaps they might be enjoying themselves without me, I resolved to go down and see if I could not do something to annoy them. Down I went, and Henry, all smiling, introduced the girl to me as Sister Charlotte, talking of her as if he had known her for years. Was it not shameful? It must have been very awkward for you, I said. It was indeed, Sister Stenhouse, and I soon made it awkward for them, I assure you. After I joined them, there was not a soul present who had a moment's comfort till that girl went away. My husband, however, took her home, and from that very day he seemed resolved to have the upper hand. He never for a moment would listen to a word I said about the girl. 
he brought her in every evening and took her to the theatre constantly and paid her ten times more attention than he ever paid me i wasn't jealous sister stenhouse no one as i said before could ever suspect me of jealousy but i did hate that girl if he had not loved her i can't say whether i myself might not have liked her but the very fact of him loving her makes me detest her but it's only a little proper pride on my part i'm not in the least jealous oh dear no of course not i said i don't know about that she said i've borne enough from those two to drive fifty women crazy with jealousy and things went on from bad to worse until the other day when as i told you we had that little unpleasantness my husband when he came back was downright angry and made use of shocking language and told me that if he could not have peace in the house he would have me bored out by myself in some other part of the city he said that i had scratched charlotte's face and torn out her hair but that was quite untrue as i told him and as for the hair which fell out it was all an accident he said that charlotte did not like such accidents and that he would not put up with it he was very cross and disagreeable all the rest of the day and made me quite miserable and broken-hearted and the next day to wind it all up he told me that he and charlotte had arranged the day of the wedding i stormed and raved for i had fully resolved that marry whom he might he should never marry a girl if he really loved her or if i had not chosen her but it was of no use i was forced to go over with him to the endowment house to give him to that detestable little vixen i tell you sister stenhouse i hate her and oh oh dear what shall i do now my husband has fallen in love with her here to my infinite astonishment she rose from her seat and rushed about the room wringing her hands and exclaiming oh dear oh dear she then threw herself right down on the couch and actually burst into tears crying out oh dear what shall i do with my henry and that girl i raised her up and tried to comfort her as well as i could but she was a very awkward woman to deal with under such circumstances the more gently i spoke to her the more violent did she become and the louder were her lamentations she forgot that she had been the cause of her husband taking any plural wives at all and she upbraided him as the source of all her woes one moment she would denounce him as a heartless wretch then she would go into fits of maudlin sympathy over him declaring that her henry was the dearest man alive until that horrid red-headed girl led him astray oh dear dear sister stenhouse she exclaimed as she threw both arms round my neck and covered me with tears never do as i have done never get a wife for your husband again or he'll learn to do it for himself oh and sister stenhouse let us kneel down and ask the lord to strengthen us in this hour of tribulation and oh she added piteously i should take it as such a very great favor sister if you wouldn't mind trimming that bonnet for me you've got such taste i assured her that i would trim the bonnet or do anything else that would help to assuage her grief so she had her cry out and then she went on talking she stopped and had some lunch and still she talked and at last when a little girl came round with a message from her husband saying that she was wanted at home she left me in the middle of a long speech in which she was explaining the steps which she meant to take to bring her henry to reason and to compel him to obtain a divorce from that red-headed hussy that same evening she came again this time she brought with her the bonnet and the materials for trimming it and i promised her that she should have but a little while to wait for she said she was overflowing with anxiety to quit the mormon church 
and she felt convinced that that could not properly be done by any one wearing an old or dowdy bonnet she had had a warm time with the bride and the bridegroom and seemed quite cheerful at the thought that she had thoroughly spoiled the happiness of their wedding day for she had left them both with ruffled tempers and in the worst of humors after that she was almost always with me until the bonnet was finished which was not until a couple of days later for i was delayed by some more important matters which unexpectedly engaged my attention and when she went away she was as lavish with her thanks and praises as she was with her promises respecting the mighty things which she was going to do and the bright example she would become to the women of utah i did not see her for several weeks and then i accidentally met her in the street and asked her why she had not called upon me lately she was wearing her new bonnet but i had heard nothing about her apostasy oh sister stenhouse she said i'm delighted to see you you've been constantly in my thoughts but i've been so hard at work oh so busy i really had not time for anything not even to apostatize how was that i asked oh she replied when i thought over the matter i saw very clearly that it wouldn't do to render myself conspicuous with this old dress the bonnet's very nice and i want to thank you dear for the trimming but i must wait until i get that silk dress which henry says i really shall have soon i'm not so very sure though whether he would give me the dress if i were to apostatize so i'd better wait and get it first then too you see i've had my hands full if you want to make a man slight one woman and get tired of her there's nothing like putting a nicer woman than her in his way so i reconsidered the matter and resolved cost what it might i'd get another wife for my husband right away i don't care now whether she's old or young ugly or pretty so long as she cuts out that detestable red-headed girl i've run all over the town and rushed about here and there all for his sake though he'll never be grateful for it and now at last do you know dear i really do think i've got the girl i want she's all dark dark hair dark eyes dark complexion if he marries her as i mean him to do she'll lead him a fine life notwithstanding all her winning ways i wouldn't stand in his shoes when she's his wife but i know i shall be able to manage her for i have a deeper insight into character than he has and a better command of temper she'll teach miss charlotte to keep her place and she'll make henry mind too it'll do him good i've done it all out of love to him not a spark of jealousy or ill-feeling as you are well aware the idea of setting one wife against another in order to keep the peace would appear in the case of my talkative friend to have been successful for sure enough six months after the time of which i have just spoken her henry did marry the dark beauty and she and her auburn predecessor presented an interesting contrast when they chanced to appear in the street together in the company of their husband there did not seem to be much love lost between them successful in her plans and having as she said now brought her henry to reason my talkative friend gave up all idea of leaving the church and when i last saw her she said i'm busy now looking after a likely girl for i do think a man in my henry's position ought to live his religion and have at least seven wives seven you know is such a very lucky number End of chapter 42